Hey everyone, I'm excited to be talking today about a subject that's very close to my heart and something I've been thinking about for a while and, and I've been working on. And this is diving into this question of why uh, browser dev tools don't understand your code. And just to give some background, I've had a lot of experience and uh, I think many, many people in the audience are familiar with these development environments like Visual C++, Xcode, and then these game engines that understand your code, meaning that while you're Deving, you have some kind of visual representation or something in the dev tool that really works with your code in the terms of your code. And conversely, we see when working in the web using JavaScript and TypeScript to build front ends, we have tools that don't really understand our code, they do other things. And in this talk, I'm gonna be talking about why I think this has been historically the case. And I'm also gonna be talking about this project that I've been working on uh, recently called Mighty Melt, which aims to close that gap. So let's get a little bit into the history uh, my personal experience, you know, I started developing early in my career. I was doing Windows apps and I got used to this Windows form builder where you could build the UI visually in the dev tool and then connect that really elegantly to code. In Xcode, uh, building iOS apps, uh, there's this thing called Interface Builder that I used quite a bit, which allows you to visually structure your app uh, using a, a visual tool and then sort of code at the same time using a real uh, programming language. Um, the experience that I think is actually the best in this regard is what I've experienced with uh, the Unity game engine. And this is pretty standard practice for, for game engines. And I'll just hop right now to this video so we can just get some visuals of what I kind of think of is like a kind of peak experience. So basically this video uh, is from Game Maker's Toolkit channel and uh, they're gonna be going in and basically making a game over screen that appears on their game. And the way you do this in Unity is, is very visual and very intuitive and uh, also very powerful because you can code anything you want uh, in the system, and as you know, games do, do a lot of things that require quite a lot of uh, very real code. And so you basically see here, uh, they're adding a game over text, and now they're gonna be adding a button. And you just kind of drag these things on, use visual tools to set them up. At no point are you, you know, messing with CSS, going back and forth, hopping through like many text files. To size something, you size it directly, which I think is a great, uh, great I found to be a great experience working here and uh, in this environment. And you can also, if you want to do uh, an on-click handler, you can see here there is no on-click handler. And now they're basically going to go ahead and hop over to the code. And you see here, everything's in C-sharp. And you can go and add your... Uh, event handler, in this case we start game, go ahead and import some deep Unity guts on the scene management um, uh, as a package. I'm not sure what it's called in C-sharp actually, it's been a while. But anyway, call this load scene function, um, basically when the callback is triggered. And now you can go and uh, uh, go to your on-click handler, link it up to that actual uh, piece of code. And, uh, and then with that all wired up, you can basically play your game and see it all happening right there on the screen. And this is what I think of as a peak development experience. This was my peak development experience when I worked for Unity. Uh, I didn't work for Unity, <laughs> sorry. When I was working on a lot of Unity uh, games and uh, some VR projects in Unity as well. And it's really cool actually. You can even pause the game while you're running it and look at all the stuff contributing to what you see on screen and understand it visually in a way that's code aware. And many years ago, I transitioned from Unity to doing web work. And ever since then, I've been asking myself, why can't the web have uh, something like like this, this way of working. Because uh, the way we work currently in the web is, uh, you know, you have typical view, you have your browser, and of course you have your VS code or your text editor. But while you're looking at your app, you have this view, which is the inspect view, the typical Chrome DevTools inspect view, Firefox, all, all browsers have something like this, where you can see the DOM of your app as you're working on it. And this is certainly useful, but it's not very close to your code. And as apps have gotten more and more and more sophisticated, the gap between DOM, the DOM and what's in your code is getting bigger and bigger. In the React world, we have the React DevTools, which show you, uh, it can actually show you some of your components, but the React DevTools are also something processed. This is um, a bunch of stuff here that I don't see in my code at all. And so the picture that this DevTool shows me isn't really a code accurate picture. And this is uh, really something I've been thinking about for a long time and I uh, started working on this project because I just feel like we can do better in the web. And then you start to ask yourself, you know, the, the question of the central question of this talk, like, why don't we have this yet? Why don't browser dev tools understand your code? And so before I start getting into the way I think we could fix this, let's talk a little bit about the history and how this came to be. Uh, if you're an old timer uh, like me, I think I, I qualify as one because I actually remember Dreamweaver when it came out. And a lot of old timers, when, when we talk, I talk about this, they say Dreamweaver, uh, that failed, you know, like can't be done. And uh, Dreamweaver actually didn't 
fail. It was a really successful product in terms of um, as like maybe the first no-code tool, but it didn't achieve its aim of making an environment where you could go back and forth between a Photoshop-like visual experience and real code editing. And that was what Dreamweaver was trying to aspire to. What ended up happening in practice is if you started to make a complex site, you started layering some JavaScript and other stuff like that, um, and working a lot in Dreamweaver, the code got progressively more messy the more you worked in Dreamweaver. And so it wasn't really suitable for this back and forth between code and design. And also, like if you wrote a bunch of code, Dreamweaver wouldn't necessarily understand it, and, and things just kind of fell apart. And so this dream of having a real synchronicity between a visual tool and code goes back, you know, this is about 20 years that Dreamweaver uh, goes back, and a lot of old timers are like, we tried it, it didn't work, um, and you know, can't, can't be done is the, the core uh, the follow on of those uh, if you start thinking in that way. Of course, we can think, think about things afresh today. Um, but anyway, I, I don't want to paint Dreamweaver as too much of a failure because Dreamweaver was actually a massive success. They just sunset the project a couple of years ago. I think it started in the late 90s. And Dreamweaver has, uh, was really the forerunner of a lot of these no-code tools. And uh, it, uh, things like you know, Weebly, Wix, Squarespace, and, and Webflow, these tools where you can work visually in a visual tool and generate code. And these have been a tremendous success and are really great for people who don't um, don't know how to code, want to make something that simple. Uh, but of course, as, as all we know, we're, I think pretty much everyone in the audience here, JavaScript developer or, or in that ecosystem, there are a lot of things that you need code for. You need um, certain excellent performance. You need a little a lot of sophistication. You want to bring together a lot of third-party libraries. You want to connect to your certain microservices or your CMS layer. Um, once you enter the world of code, you can do anything. And when you're building really complex and sophisticated projects, or maybe you know smaller projects that need certain things to happen very well, we turn to code over and over again because these platforms don't give us the uh, flexibility. So um, the code is great, but obviously as developers, we want something that works with our code and these sort of design to code uh, solutions haven't been able to go in the other, other direction. Another answer uh, that an old timer will tell you, uh, not quite as old as Dreamweaver, but uh, shortly thereafter, there was this decade where Flash was driving a lot of the experiences on the web. And Flash has a Flash actually really succeeded at unifying code and the visuals. And a lot of people who were building things during that time remember very fondly how amazing it was to be able to work uh, with an artist and have this uh, sort of visual tool that could help you develop that also was tightly connected to your code. Uh, Flash didn't make it through the transition to, to mobile uh, for performance reasons. Uh, another thing that's interesting about Flash that I think is especially pertinent to um, sort of what, where I see some of the challenges of making this kind of dev tool is Flash's shortcut. So Flash did everything uh, in the early days, you would have a Flash movie. And so it's kind of like Canvas uh, today, where you'd have a box where you would be drawing your Flash content. And that's where everything lived. And if you're working in the authoring environment, you'd be authoring something to live in that box. And that's actually makes things much, much simpler. Flash tried to make the transition to being sort of anywhere on your web page, um, <coughs> more into this document model we see in the web. And they didn't really uh, succeed with that. Uh, there's this thing called Flex that um, that I used some and was a little bit successful, but it didn't seem to really have the same kind of dynamism of just the pure open web with everything, open standards, all kinds of stuff uh, popping into the page, being dynamically loaded with different technologies. And so <coughs> I think Flash, um, uh, didn't adequately solve the problem in sort of what we need for the web. So I think that's kind of why Flash isn't around and why something like Flash hasn't taken over uh, to provide this uh, for us. Um, so, but this sort of the third answer to the question and uh, sort of hard my talk is, you know, is actually we can do this now. Like uh, that we, we might have not had these in the past, but the time is right for web dev tools to start to understand your code and allow you to work, allow you to work uh, visually with it. And, um, you know, core to making this work is to have some kind of, part of your code, some visual part of your code for the dev tool to work on. And so this is again, kind of like why this is easy in other environments and difficult on the web. Okay. In other environments, yeah, so whether I mean, it's Unity, uh, Interface Builder, or Flash, for example, you have this you uh, scene file, being which is basically browser, this thing that uh, has all the geometry know, and all the layout in it, being able and it's closely Figma tied to the UI. And Photoshop, the other thing that these Google environments have like going for them is that they're closed. That they're owned by some like Unity, uh, Apple, they their own these various environments. And so if you have this closed environment and a scene file where everything is in these XY coordinates, it can become pretty easy to then make it as well. It's easy, it's natural, it happens over and over and over again to make, make a dev tool that acts on that and scene how do file. We, uh, the challenges this, with the web uh, are twofold. You know, that one, the question. like what is the so scene file the for the web? That you take, uh, like like code what or what a module dictates function, what things look like separate in, from the functionality on the web? Um, and then the other so thing is like, well, the web is, Golang, um, there's no, no controls and then, other standards uh, bodies, standards bodies and corporate groups and things, but the web is kind of an open anarchistic environment where there's no one dictating how things get done. And so sort of back to 
before we get into my you answer as to why I think it's going to be done now, uh, in the whole history uh, of the map, it's been a cost challenge. And if you look at uh, the evolution of what you could call the uh, scene file you know, for the map, uh, you, actually in the early days of the web, in uh, Tim Berners-Lee, uh, 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 time when he was originating leveraging. the web, and there was kind of a scene file. HTML is a basic visual description, and you could see DevTools working really well, and that actually Dreamweaver, if you only have HTML, is a really pretty good tool, because it's pretty one-to-one with what you're working on the hood. The challenge with the web is that very quickly people started adding CSS and JavaScript to HTML editor. in now, order to have a a functionality, uh, global control uh, styles, all the nice things FFMPEG. we kind of take for granted now a um, in like the mid to late 90s. And, it's and used that made things a lot like, you know, more challenging to separate the visual together. layer from more the functional together, layer to sort of right. break so out of, like, the part of the code that you can kind of see visually and that would relate to what you saw on the screen while you're running your site. In the industry, this is I guess probably the late mid to late 90s that these things came in and sometime around the early to mid aughts MVC started to uh, become a really uh, dominant way of library, thinking about the web. Library, right? So uh, thinking so about when Ruby on Rails appeared and, and things like that, the KPHP and various MVC frameworks started to have these template layers that abstract away some of the visual. And then there were actually like template builders you could get, but it didn't really get you too deep into the app because the templates were very, very shallow visually and not as connected to what was happening in the rest of the app. And then about 10 years ago, with the advent of React, we got this thing called JSX. And so JSX is, is actually uh, very know, powerful uh, and as an example, a very uh, clean like say, way of uh, separating I'm, I'm what appears on the screen of, uh, from what doesn't appear on the screen example. in a way that's very so, connected like, let's say that, to functionality uh, and also um, the sort of component, the like components work of really bundling like together feature, functionality so, you know, with display in a way that's building block like. And so my sort of thinking as to why it's taking so long for us to really be able to do this on the web has a lot to do with the time it took for JSX to kind of appear and get to a point of maturity. And now that we're here, this kind of thing seems uh, very possible. Um, and it doesn't seem possible. Uh, I've been uh, working by uh, with some people. We've been so building that's we see that um, very, uh, this thing called Mighty Melt, uh, which is a code-aware dev tool that basically, basically understands your code. Um, but at the same time, by your code, you I mean get JSX and the style, uh, part of uh, the, your code. You know, the so I'm going to talk a little bit about how this works and how it all can be done uh, in this open standards world of the, uh, of the web. But before I talk about how it works, I'm going to give a brief demo so you can see kind of what it is and get a feel for uh, or for my requirement as such. Uh, so, so that's why like, over. it's very um, small binaries, but they are your, polyglot because you know you have uh, a React uh, project. the capability so, of using most um, of the popular like programming standard, languages and converting uh, their functions React project into awesome modules. Uh, built so using that's one of the great things about that. Shocker UI. But and of course the question is that hey, like, is I've so added the money mail limited to browsers because we saw that there's so many great applications. Uh, and then, but the thing is that um, I've set up this config file, actually the installer uh, set this up for me, that we get but it, uh, you know, web it basically has a command and for one how of the run biggest features is that it can server. run and then with the same these things in place, module, it can, can basically run in MPX a number emails. of different and, you know, ways. Um, and of course, uh, it'll pop you can up leverage it in cloud, you can in this, leverage uh, it in service studio. functions. And because here I see the capability of its uh, instant my, start times, my app running. Uh, you know, one of the great things so in service computing is the cold start um, time that we generally see with, uh, you know, uh, running so. your, like, let's um, say, so my app is actually AWS running here Lambda in instance, Mighty Melvin, uh, it's just an iframe uh, cold start time of, can be anywhere from uh, 10 to 15, 20 seconds. You know, um, so far and of course, like, the benefit of having developing, being able to run a multi-traditional platform that means that you can leverage these or tools um, the console. But uh, across click multiple this edit different button, platforms, that's where things start to uh, so if you're, you're interesting. Talking about as I click around, talking about VMs, I see it can run um, everywhere. Not, of course, not like there's the DOM, a benefit but I see of getting more like security. Code. And so you so can see there's this uh, React tree over here, you know, I'm clicking the sidebar of component the as I click on different things, like, uh, how, um, the like, let's say, uh, pieces that drive them, highlight, like we everything started is started with component aware. On-prem servers. Then we went to also sort of that uh, JSX aware. So this is actually this is actually being drawn high end in a map. Uh, machines um, that were and not can, locally point, available over, to us via uh, an editor call and then see what's going on here. So you see this thing on the left basically a better is a representation of, of my JSX. Base. It uh, includes things like navigating the reason every item is this map. And so when I select uh, you know, this, like, um, it's you just one thing in the JSX and four things on the screen, as you would expect from the, the way it's uh, written. But that has led I can also see props where um, actually, that are put like, on this uh, same process as here, up here, here. So you can see the props, um, and, and um, it can run for standard props, you get nice drop-downs where you can work with things. And so the first thing that this 
development environment as long as you're part you of the program as a way and of then inspecting like, uh, with your app, assembly, that's uh, because code of small where, size so you can and inspect you can see what's going on it is and everything's really phrased in terms up, like, you know, of your code kind of super useful for uh, you know, helping into a new project to kind of understand interest, what component uh, buys what uh, and as you can see as I click around this is a TV series component it has a movie list I can like even go around this way or I can drill down that way to drill down deeply into the movie cards or even like the bookmark icon and see how everything is put together and so it's pretty rich inspection you know, experience. slides or one of the three uh, slides given go, um, Heights, who uh, and, and if Bosley, uh, so, like, uh, to the extent that with, things appear uh, you know, styles, uh, Twitter they can or like let's say so with, with, with Docker, then perhaps movies, is not uh, um, have and had any need to app, you know have right there, uh, can, web assembly, uh, duplicate this uh, not or, have Docker uh, in the first place. Twice or but of course, like web assembly is you know like the server or basically as I'm doing this, you can then see that these changes are happening to the source code on my local disk. So it's a dev tool flow. It's just kind of doing the same code updates I would do. Because that gives you access to the bytecode alliance. So, yeah, I mean, it goes on to say that, you know, like, there's a lot of scope for everything around. And the founder of Docker himself said that, you know, like, how much he loved using that. So I could drag it up here and it reorders it. Of course, as I'm building, I can hop over into drive mode and, like, experience the app. Like, let's you start as a user, you write some code, and it's written in Rust, right? And I notice, oh, hey, these are inconsistent, so I can hop back over to edit mode. And, you know, as well, make it feel consistent because, I guess, this is a different uh, system right. in this, this case, like you're using Cargo Build, is the, which is the, uh, the build uh, system card. for uh, and so Rust products. Using this, I can and then make, we give it the uh, changes. target of uh, Wazi 32, uh, 30, Wazi 32, Wazi, which allows uh, you to convert styles. your Rust program uh, into a WebAssembly module. Right, um, and it has, as you can see, like support like for all have, uh, major, you know, yeah, sections gap, like, like for X square, X square, X square, X and ARM. Um, uh, so, so I can go and make those, those and, changes. Yeah. So that's like um, one example that we are we basically have, uh, are going to be using. And of course, like, you know, the point here, is so, that um, the WebSemi like, module itself cannot really do uh, anything on its own. Yeah. Uh, because so it is the building, kind can, of part uh, are, of the security these building blocks are actually uh, sandbox, of, uh, which allows, uh, it does not allow any so external drag, function calls say, uh, to be made with it. And in order to make those calls or for your version model to interact with your files, and so once you have this foundation of understanding the code, you can start to actually manipulate the code with, you know, so that awesome, same feel uh, these code builders like onto your time. coded web app. There's we have some AI the set up, so it's like a natural way so that is to deal with some AI. You know, with, uh, background you know the green, major aspect. Rotate the color or something of, like that. Uh, you, know, you can uh, give session, some uh, for, uh, AI prompts, uh, because, and you know, like, it'll Wazi update your code. The but they're for you. So with this kind of setup, you can change. And then the other thing you can do is you can actually make commits. And so if we look at all the code changes that have been done, this is very different from the typical code generation experience that I think many of us have maybe not suffered through for a long time. Looking at some of these older uh, APIs ways of doing this, host, um, uh, you know, getting a big chunk of generated code is uh, so fun. That is like, um, you know, because that this dev tool is so um, synchronized with like your JSX and understands like your JSX Docker so well, and your, together, and your style right? so well, uh, so when it makes code uh, updates, you can actually like do it in a very targeted way, in a nutshell, very clean uh, surgical updates to your code based on just the things that you change. Yeah, so that's kind of the basically run through of what my mill feels. And now let's get into uh, because the, of the fact that um, both complement each other, a wasm is how, great because how this actually a smaller works. startup so time. Think, yeah, now we know that here. containers yeah, so uh, can be anywhere through. from like a few megabytes um, to easily okay. hundreds of megabytes in size. And let's, starting let's walk through the basic setup can take a of, lot of, time. of how this so works. So if you have any so, high compute um, intensive tasks that is, can quickly uh, spin up right and you want to shut down, the then wasm is actually this thing that runs locally. And you can run your other thing that basically sits next to your app on your local machine or wherever you're development uh, environment is really and uh, um, so yeah. basically and runs your you app. Check out, and like, so when Envoy and, runs your app, uh, yeah, it does a few different speed. things to it. It runs it by executing um, a command. Like, you know, the idea is that uh, JSON. It also instruments it so that um, run, uh, when you know, in the DOM, Docker, we actually can see uh, where things come from in code. And it also imports a, well. a JavaScript um, package. Uh, that basically contained provides edition. this thing called the browser and API. That gives and so, rise, uh, basically fundamentally the, the way this works, and this kind of, I think, gets back to that question of open standards. Of you know, how, do you, how do you deal with so that's like um, one of the you know, great everyone running things in so many different ways uh, you on the have, web, like, let's say, and the web being an open uh, platform, if you and the answer to that is, well, we let you run your app the way you do. This works with Next, this works with Veed, it works with a bunch of other things, and that we use sort of things like plugin and JavaScript to augment that app when it runs. And in other ones, you can set up very standardized functionality in that app, um, even though, of you know, as well. you can kind of and uh, here's like one example of, where of you can see that you know, uh, so uh, what we're mainly doing is um, uh, we have and some function where you're first studio. converting a Rust function, a Rust right program here, into which is, the, uh, you know, like into the target, 
right? And that's basically and then, uh, this uh, interactive environment. Example it um, where, uh, uses iframes to load the web app. Web app. And in this case, uses the browser API uh, to talk to that app. So if I click on something, it. it's actually uh, talking to the browser API to understand what I'm clicking on and also to sort of get from the instrument where it is input. So I'll definitely recommend you to check that out. And some of that information that allows us to kind of run the app and allow me to click. These are some of the sites that allow you to basically do it. Again, I'm not going too deep into it. Let's focus a little bit on the inspection experience before we get into changing how things work. Uh, just talking about the inspection uh, experience, I click on something, and, and because this browser API exists, uh, I can know what I'm like clicking all on. Of that, and like then if you want the studio to, uses uh, information provided by this thing called Scribe to show this nice JSX tree and these nice styles. So let's talk a little bit about the Scribe. What does the Scribe do? The Scribe actually um, shares um, code like updates. Where are so basically, it, it, uh, it gets the code from uh, the Envoy. The so Envoy launches and gives uh, not all the code, just um, with, you know, cloud code that you choose in your config file. Uh, it's the front-end code, um, essentially, course, like, to the Scribe. The Scribe processes it and then and has these the representations of uh, the so that JSX entities and components and the styles and everything and passes those to Studio. And so Studio kind of brings it together because all this information comes from Scribe and then the browser API. So the WebSendly component Model, uh, uh, essentially so that means also, uh, something you know, like this. That, uh, like let's say that uh, you have two separate well. programs. Um, uh, one program and so is that's basically in, how uh, Studio shows you what you're in Golan, clicking on, and you create WebSendly um, modules for these on them. Uh, so we have the WebSendly C++ diagram, and then the next big piece is change. So the idea really is that how does that you are basically going to be creating like these two separate WebSendly modules, but then both of these modules cannot actually interact with each other. So how does that work? Um, right. And that and basically like that kind of uh, is a communication so, process uh, yeah, that the studio I mean, really uh, that basically tells the scribe what kind of moves uh, you want it to make. Uh, and then, the main um, focus the uh, is figures like, out know, what the new code needs to be, and then passes the code um, update over to Envoy, and also passes the updated uh, representations and, like, let's to the studio. That you have written, so studio uh, can actually update uh, this tree. Uh, and if I drag this, it basically gets a new tree from Scribe, and also updates the code, and takes the advantage of hot load to make the app actually update. So the new representation goes to Studio, and also goes to Envoy, which triggers the hot reload, which causes the app to update, and you see it fresh in Studio. And then as for the final piece in terms of being able to make commits. Allow you to um, clean code is here, like and actually, if I want, I can you know, load it up in my own local, local GitHub or well. you use uh, VS Code. Um, so, yeah, I mean, with the component um, model, if there uh, are two separate model, however, models, however I do it traditionally, um, my mail also has a few uh, commands in to be able to make a commit. So, now in order to basically do that, you can make commits right here. Uh, like, you know, uh, you um, and basically, the way all that is, works is um, by just passing can, messages through. This part's pretty simple. Just passes uh, a message to the scribe, you know, uh, scribe talks to Envoy. Uh, Since the Envoy is running the on the local disk, you can actually get commands. All of the different and, uh, models that are there of, inside of, of this wrapper. And so, um, these are how all the pieces uh, come together uh, uh, in order to basically take the JSX styles and understand them from the code and then pass that information to studios so it can be manipulated. And then you have to manipulate it. You have to manipulate it. You have to manipulate it. The um, that's model how you get a dev tool is a that uh, runs on the web, the understands your code, model, um, and allows you to inspect and kind of find your way to your, your bearings, uh, that, uh, and, uh, your apps, all of the shared, um, and uh, also like, you know, uh, change visual uh, things uh, like visually. Uh, well, uh, you know, the users, of course, um, you know, uh, models, yeah, like all that can be, about this. can be provided. Yeah, and so this is kind of how workflow uh, works in the Mighty Mill universe. You can still do everything in VS Code the traditional way, and Mighty Mill attaches to the visual code, as well as little bits of the model. Visual code. And I think that's and something that might grow like, over like, time. Essentially not looking here at like item dot name or like format. nav links, like uh, and you can basically showing you the actual well. data that you're uh, working you know, with. Like, uh, so, and then you can translate um, these yeah, like with the help of the canonical here. API. So uh, that means that here now you can, you know, actually, like let's say um, truly have a polyglot uh, uh, platform yeah, where like, you could take and import here, movie it in Rust and import it inside of a program written in Python because there's like some kind of some kind of interaction here with the non-visual stuff and conditional rendering and things like that. Um, right now, uh, of course, sometimes you see can, you know, once um, things things like that appearing in uh, and attributes. Uh, so yeah, right now there's like a little bit of non-visual code you can kind of see, but um, that sort of thing here, again, inspired you know, by things like the uh, game engine, where I mean, there's just times where uh, you're going to want to be banging out uh, a bunch of deeper code, and that's best done in text editors right now, which are also getting much better with all the new technology that's coming online. So that's basically how this visual dev workflow happens, and how it seems like, you know, 
uh, historically, browser depth tools, tools have not restricted your code, like, but it seems like uh, the tides are starting uh, to turn, and it's both possible and seeming more likely that browser dev tools for people who are building things and reaction platforms like that are going to be much more code aware and kind of bring all of us in the web community. Having that same kind of level of experience that you need devs have and Unreal devs have, where you can like build the thing, see it visually, move it around, run your app, pause the game in the middle, fix things, pick it up again, and basically really, really tie into things. And it's very exciting thing to be working on. Uh, and also, like, very exciting to be doing this on the web because the web actually has one extremely amazing thing that we built, which is Hot Reload. And uh, Unity, um, at least when I was working on it, didn't have Hot Reload, and so you couldn't really edit things on the fly. But because the web allows us, like, HMR, new technologies around Hot Reload are coming out all the time, the web really just allows us to do this and work in like a way that I actually think is like even better than what you can achieve with things like uh, Unity. Uh, anyway, thanks so much for your time. Uh, glad to share this today. And uh, yeah, if you have any thoughts or questions, like my email's uh, right here. Uh, please don't be shy about reaching out. Thank you.